Okay, as Ruth has said, I am uh, with Tech Impact. And for those of you who don't know who we are, we are also a nonprofit. And, um, and our mission is to um, uh, use technology and leverage it to help advance uh, social impact um, uh, through our clients. So how do we do that? So uh, we engage in um, three main tiers of service here. We offer uh, tech services uh, to nonprofits. Um, we analyze uh, your needs and then uh, set you up with technical solutions that fit um, their, your needs and then help you deliver your services to your clients. We also manage some nonprofit education and training programs. Um, very helpful, they're available on our website. Uh, you want to take a look around and um, broaden your horizons in terms of technology and security. And we also have workforce development uh, programs as well, which are very, very crucial uh, to help uh, shaping uh, young minds and providing that much needed workforce for the future. So as I said, my name is Felipe Mondragon. Um, I am information security engineer here with Tech Impact. I uh, have a professional career for over 25 years. Sounds odd to say that. Um, excuse me one second. Yes. In many different industries, including the financial, energy, and now nonprofit industries. So, so I work with Tech Impact so that I can help uh, uh, contribute and help organizations um, maximize uh, their value to the community and um, educating them more on security and helping them help themselves. So uh, today we're gonna talk about uh, why, why nonprofits are so heavily targeted uh, by cyber threat actors. We'll also cover very briefly the, the threat landscape as it, um, the ones that target most likely, they're most likely to target nonprofits. We'll review their common attack methods. So we'll become familiar with the how and then we'll talk about some best practices and hopefully have a good conversation about um, how these best practices can be applied in, in your organization. And then we'll cover a little bit about some uh, support uh, options that are available as well. So let's start with the, with the why. So as we know, uh, cyber attacks happen universally across the world to all industries, but nonprofits especially uh, are heavily targeted. And the reason why is that nonprofits manage uh, just as a part of, of the way we do business is very sensitive information, which can be very valuable uh, to attackers. Um, and you put that together with um, the fact that many nonprofits don't, don't have the sophistication or the budget to support full security programs uh, like per se a bank might uh, or, um, or a large organization that's developing um, innovating new technology. So <clears throat> you put those two things together and it creates a, um, a situation where they're easy targets uh, for attackers. And uh, sensitive data could be anything from as simple as personal identi identifiable information, names, addresses, social security numbers, donor information, sensitive client information, perhaps information that we collect about uh, some of our clients uh, uh, for a, a vulnerable populations such as children, for example. Um, personal health information for those nonprofits that help deliver health services to clients. And of course, credit cards, we already, we already heard in the, in the chat, for those of you that heard it, um, one of you, your donation page was, was uh, was hijacked on your page. That's a very common attack vector, actually. Um, and underfunded IT security budgets. That's important to realize that security is not just about, say, cybersecurity. IT and the management of IT infrastructure is very important as well. Um, and also understaffed. So um, those of you who are fortunate enough to have sophisticated cybersecurity tools, unfortunately, the level of sophistication of these tools is not quite where they can, you can just turn it on and let it run on its own. There still should be somebody monitoring those tools, monitoring the output, and, uh, and, and, and maybe putting together two separate events um, and, act, and responding to them. So understaffed is also a huge issue. 
um, or maybe you have the staff, but they're not properly trained. Um, another big, big issue as well. And un untrained staff won't be able to help as much in terms of being able to properly identify um, when there's uh, something amiss in the organization. And the last one is, is very important as well. Unprepared for incidents, we see this, see this quite a lot. Um, in most cases, um, the, the most critical time during an incident is immediately once it's discovered, the longer the incident goes on without being addressed, the greater the impact. So here are the threat actors. And when I say threat actors, these are the different categories. I mentioned earlier before different industries and different industries had their own uh, specific profile of threat actors that target them uh, based on on, on what they have that's of value. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, nonprofits uh, have a very specific profile in that they have valuable data and information and it's poorly, in some cases, poorly um, secured. Um, also, um, uh, the, the value of that data um, uh, can, can, can vary widely between different organizations, but in general, it's an easy target for cyber criminals. Um, <clears throat> That data, that value may be in the form of reselling data, depending on what type of data you have, could be credit card numbers, for example, or holding it for ransom. Someone I believe already mentioned they've seen, they've been experiencing uh, the experience of ransomware attack several years ago. So those are the two main ways that we see cyber criminals um, exploit uh, nonprofit data. Um, in the middle category here, hacktivists, uh, it's a bit different. So their motivation isn't profit, it's more of advancing their own ideology or disrupting whichever ideology your nonprofit might support. So in, in, in that bucket, what we see more is more of just a defacing of websites, for example, deletion of, of data, or just essentially disrupting um, operations for that nonprofit. Um, so whereas the cyber criminals will sneak in or, or infiltrate or attempt to trick you into giving information, the hacktivists will simply find a weak spotting organization and exploit it immediately to cause that disruption. And insiders is a unique category because um, it's important to note that an insider um, may not necessarily be a malicious person within your organization. Um, it's very often, most often actually uh, accidental. So uh, going back to the previous uh, slide about untrained, untrained staff, inadvertent sharing of sensitive information, which can cause uh, a major impact for your organization in terms of uh, loss of trust from your donors, from your client base, uh, as well as uh, in some cases, um, uh, regulatory fines as well. Uh, so the insider one is, 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 is most often overlooked, but also uh, very important because uh, it could be anyone in the organization. Um, uh, if they're not properly trained, not only on the value of the data they're working with, but the ways that they should be securing it when they process, uh, share, or store that, that data. Any questions so far? Okay. I'll move forward. So let's talk about common ways the threat actors will attempt to uh, to breach your network. So, um, so the top one is data breaches, right? So, uh, client records, sensitive information, credit card information, etc. <clears throat> the goal will be to get their hands on that data and either remove it or hold it for ransom and, and demand payment. So, very, very uh, common. Uh, you see it together with phishing attacks. So the phishing attack will be launched against your organization or one of the users specifically in your organization uh, with the goal of getting access. And then once that access is obtained, then they either go in and in, uh, encrypt the data or they'll take it, uh, email it out or share it out through uh, um, the SharePoint drive itself. Um, phishing attacks in general are also used uh, not only to distribute malware for ransomware to steal credentials, but in many cases as well uh, for social engineering uh, to impersonate maybe one of your vendors 
or one of your uh, suppliers uh, to misdirect payments. We see that often. Um, and then uh, effectively stealing funds from your organization. Um, one of the most disruptive cases we've seen also is when uh, your own nonprofit or employees paycheck was diverted, uh, which again then impacts your, your staff as well. So the ransomware um, is very malicious payload. Um, and we still see uh, in the news actually ransomware attacks on local city governments, which share many of the same uh, risk profiles as, as nonprofits. Uh, city government services get disrupted. Uh, the data is uh, held ransom or their systems are completely unusable because uh, all the systems are locked down. Um, in some cases, uh, not receiving the data even when they pay the ransom. So it's, it's a very difficult challenge to overcome. Uh, so what some organizations do now is they'll get the cyber insurance to pay the ransom, but then you also have to have a backup of the data uh, just in case the attackers decide not to hold up their end of the bargain, which happens. And of course, the insider threat vectors, um, accidentally sharing data, as I mentioned before, uh, various different reasons why this could occur, um, lack of training, as I mentioned before, or lack of uh, awareness of the, the, the sensitivity of the data that they're, they're using. So perhaps the data is not stored where it should be, it's mixed in with other data, and the uh, employee doesn't realize that by opening up a share drive, they're actually exposing sensitive data to the to folks who don't have the, the clearance to view it. Um, or in other cases, uh, it's simply accidental. They'll email the wrong file to the wrong person. So um, a lot of times it comes down to process. Like, you know, the, it, does your company have a classification of data established? Do they train their users on how they should be processing that data, sharing it and storing it? And do they have the right tools uh, available to them to do so securely? Moving on. So let's talk about some best practices your organization um, uh, should, should. And um, if you haven't done it already, definitely uh, prioritize this. The, the multi-factor authentication is probably your, the number one solution to uh, many of the issues that we've, we, we've talked about uh, today. And um, it, uh, we hear many times organizations uh, push back and say, well, not all of my employees have a phone or we don't have company phones. Our employees don't want to uh, install any applications on their personal phones. So it becomes really an, an issue of, of accepting risk. So um, those of you facing those challenges, I, I would strongly recommend um, educating your users uh, about what exactly is happening when you're not agreeing to uh, adopt the multi-factor authentication policy at your organization. And uh, they're accept effectively accepting that risk that uh, if there's a breach on their account, then they'll be the ones who will directly be responsible for that. So um, again, I can't stress this enough. The multi-factor authentication is, is, if you don't already have it enabled at your organization should be the number one priority for, for this year. Um, there's many good options depending on what type of a platform you're using. If you're using Microsoft or Google, um, and the technology has evolved over the last few years, so it's not as uh, disruptive as it once was, where you had to log in and enter your code constantly. Um, the technology has evolved towards more adaptive now. So if you log in once and then you continue to log in from the same location using your same device, and it doesn't ask you every single time. So it should be, uh, it, it's a lot less invasive as, as, as it was when it was first developed. So, which is great. You always want a good balance between security and the ability to continue um, conducting business at the organization. The second one here is uh, patching and updating your system. So, so what that means is uh, whether you're using Windows, which is what we often see, or MacBooks or even Pixelbooks, whatever system you're using to process information, at your organization, it's very important that you keep those inventoried and updated with the latest security patches. So I mentioned before, the threat actor is one of the footholds they look for 
is a weakness in the system. And those weaknesses are very well published. Um, uh, and so if, if you neglect to patch and keep those up to date, then you're, it's like leaving all the windows and doors in your house unlocked. Eventually, someone's going to walk in. So the third one is unique in that the policy. So um, we see a lot of nonprofits struggle with writing security policy and they get caught up in which template to use or, um, or, uh, or the language within it. The real purpose of a security policy is to align your organization with a particular cybersecurity framework. So what the framework is, and there's many different frameworks, but uh, there's, there's frameworks developed specifically for small business and nonprofits where it simplifies the security controls and, and, and it lines them out in terms of what you should be doing and how. The policy, all it is is, is, is a formal way of, of letting your organization know and others that uh, our nonprofit is aligning ourselves with XYZ security framework and we are striving to perform XYZ uh, activities to support uh, uh, the adoption of that framework. So uh, you'll see malware policies, uh, access policies, <clears throat> data retention policies. So they don't have to be complex, but they do have to be comprehensive. And it's very important also that your policies are published so that everyone in your organization understands them. And, uh, and, and there's supporting procedures to, to, so that folks are actually adopting that practice. Um, but a policy in itself isn't going to stop a cyber attack against your organization, but it helps foster that, that, that culture within the organization to change the, the, the behaviors of your employees uh, to make them less likely to either accidentally um, um, share something they're not supposed to share uh, but more importantly, again, develop that security culture within your organization. So the cybersecurity training and awareness is um, something I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, maybe some of you are already doing that in your organization, which is great. And uh, it's effectively, it's educating your users about what the best practices are that the organization is striving to follow. And also training them in terms of how they integrate that into their day-to-day. -day. One of the most important features of one of these programs are, are phishing simulation campaigns, which uh, are, again, are very important in terms of getting your users used to identifying that threat in the email, as uh, Aretha was saying in the beginning, and reporting it. <clears throat> so I wanna make a note, a comment about that because recognizing a phishing email and not clicking it or giving your information is very important, of course. And that's usually tracked by, uh, my click rate. So um, if I were to send all of you an email, a test email today, we would measure who clicked on it, who didn't click on it to identify how uh, aware and how well-trained our staff is in terms of recognizing the threat. But the second piece of that, in, in my opinion, more important is the, is the reporting. So what that means is when you receive that suspicious email, you look at it, you recognize that it's suspicious, I'm not going to click on this. I'm not going to enter my password, whatever it is. Then you must report it. And the reason why that's so important is it creates that uh, awareness for your security or IT team that there may be an issue there. And in the event of a real phishing attack, the sooner your security and IT team is aware of it and stops it and erases the emails from the system, uh, the, the lower the likelihood of a, of a negative impact on your organization. Whereas if the email is not reported, you might be safe because you didn't click it, but then your five other coworkers may not be aware of it and then they click on it. So keep that in mind. And then we also strongly recommend doing a training simulation at least monthly and uh, alternating those, uh, the, the training, uh, if, if possible, structure it as close as you can to the types of emails you're your team is, is likely to see. Um, what you don't want to do is just send the same uh, template emails every month to your team by, oh, you have a package or, um, and, you know, try to make it a little bit more creative so that it really sharpens the skill set of, of your employees. So earlier we did talk about incident response plans and, and how important they are. 
um, we talked about some folks that have already had an incident recently. So that the incident response plan is very, very important, um, especially if you're managing IT and security all on your own. Um, it, the response plan is, is, is a document that you pick up in the event of a cybersecurity incident, and it, you, it, it tells you exactly what everything needs to happen to contain, um, recover, and eradicate the, eradicate and then recover um, uh, the threats uh, on your systems. And more importantly, and especially if we're talking about data and, and if you have data that uh, you lose control of, client data, for example, there has to be some type of, of response plan in terms of communication to your stakeholders. Um, so again, I can't stress that enough. Coming up with an incident response plan, what we're gonna do if we have uh, a breach, if, if we lose control of our sensitive data, um, who will we contact, how do we contact them um, is very, very important. And again, can mean the differences in terms of quickly containing an incident or letting that incident run for hours or even days. So security risk assessments, um, I, I see the term used in many different ways, but what I'm talking about here is an assessment. Um, you, you, perhaps you've done one for your cybersecurity insurance provider where they send you a link and says, click yes or no, do you do this, do you do that, do you do this? Those are, those are good to do periodically, but when I say a security risk assessment, I mean going a bit deeper and analyzing your organization uh, data flows in terms of what type of data do we take in? What do we do with it once we have it? Um, who has access to it? Where do we store it? And then uh, evaluating your network as well. Uh, do we have a firewall in the office, access points? Do people work from home? Do they VPN? Do I have a server? All those things are put together and then you identify what your weak points are. And you couple that together with the threats we talked about before. And from there, you identify what the unique risks are for for your organization. It's also important to note that once those risks are identified, it, those risks are gonna be with you un, until there's a material change in the way you do business. So think of it as, 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 as a risk, a security risk. You have to, once you're aware of it, you have to manage it consistently. And uh, vulnerability assessments as well are a piece of a good security assessment. Um, it's more of a technical piece of it where your website, <clears throat> we talked earlier about hijack, a hijack website. So vulnerability assessments help identify those weak spots in your web, in your company website so that you're able to go and plug those holes before an attacker sees it and is able to exploit it. Any questions on the best practices? Yeah, Felipe, we have a few questions that came in in the chat during during this portion. Um, Clarissa is asking, uh, what kind of assurance can we obtain from third-party vendors uh, that our organization might be working with? Uh, an example would be um, a donor database or payment platform. What what kind of questions might they, they be asking to make sure uh, things are secure? That's a very good question. Sorry, what was the name? Yeah, the question came in from Clarissa. Clarissa, that's a very good question. So, it, it what you're talking about now is 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 an entire section within which should be an entire section within your security policies is is um, it's supplier risk management. So, when when you hire a supplier, um, let's say let's call it donor management as you're in your example. So, you're hiring that supplier to manage to do something for you but it's ultimately your data and you still own the risk. You just transfer that risk to them. So you have, as you've rightly asked, you have to make sure that whatever controls you would use, if you were performing that, uh, uh, that duty that they have in place. So one simple way to ask is uh, depending on the size of the organization, if it's a large, well-known national uh, provider, they should, they should have that information um, ready to go. And you ask them for an audit report on their security controls. One of the popular reports is a SOC report and, uh, and, they'll, and they'll have it on there. Or you can simply ask them to send you uh, the last audit report on their security controls and they should be, have that ready to go. 
and, and not only that, but you should also review it at least once a year uh, to make sure that they're staying on top of the control that they have. So within that report, you should see these are the threats that we're managing. These are the how we may control your data and how we secure it from those threats. Perfect. Uh, Felipe, Judy is asking a question. Um, it says, my nonprofit exists solely in the cloud with only one part-time employee. The rest of us are volunteers using our personal computers from our home. How does this magnify our, our security issues? Yeah, so using personal devices. So let's start with the cloud only. The cloud only is great. Huge fan of the cloud only. Uh, it makes uh, securing the network a lot easier because there's less moving parts. And your cloud provider, assuming it's one of the major providers, um, adds that level of redundancy. Uh, however, um, if you don't have a good data management strategy, which means containing the data and securing it as we talked about before, uh, when you introduce unmanaged computers into the equation, which are like personal PCs, there's no way to control whether that PC has uh, the, the, the correct security controls, for example, anti-malware software, um, how long that computer has gone without being patched could have an unpatched version of Windows. It could have a threat on it at the moment. So the way to mitigate that is to control what data can get on it. And ideally, you don't want anyone saving any data on their personal devices, on their devices at all, even if we're talking about company devices. So if you can develop a good data loss prevention program where you control what data, uh, the data security within your cloud platform, Users can log in, manipulate the data there, but they shouldn't download it to their computer and, and share it out of there because that's when you can run into issues. Sure. Great advice. Um, Janice and Amanda both had a similar question related to um, MFA, multi-factor authentication. What recommendations um, do you have on that op um, on, on that? piece of, of cybersecurity and, you know, what, what are important distinctions between platforms like Microsoft Office and, and MF, MFA practices not being applied equally in all cases? Okay. So uh, you're asking how, uh, you're asking about MFA in general or specifically to Microsoft versus a different solution, for example. Yeah, maybe uh, Microsoft versus Google and, and how it pertains oh, to okay. viewing and sending email. Right. So if you're using Google Workspace, for example, then the Google multi-factor authentication works fine. Uh, and then uh, I also recommend, however, strongly recommend in an implementation such as that, that you, you restrict the authentication methods to the application only, the authenticator app, I believe it's called. The reason I say that is because number one, it's 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 more secure, much more secure than than sending the texts or the emails. Um, and in many cases, uh, it's very easy to apply that authenticator. Authenticators, your employees might already be using it, so it's also a lot easier to adopt. If you have Microsoft, same advice. If you have Microsoft, um, I definitely go with the Microsoft solution. It's very robust, uh, much more robust in terms of um, uh, customization than the, the, the Google, um, simply because with the Microsoft option, there's a lot more moving parts within a Microsoft environment than there is. Google's much simpler. Uh, but with the Microsoft, it's one thing important to know because what we always, what we see quite often, with, especially with smaller nonprofits, is the implementation of MFA is done um, in a legacy format where you turn it on by individual user. And that's not the way you want to go. You want to go with what's known as conditional access multi-factor authentication, which is uh, set up a completely different way, but it's much more uh, robust in terms of what you can do with it, uh, customizing it so that uh, it's more secure and also less of an impact on, on your users. So I mentioned it before briefly, uh, just to recap again, it's more of that adaptive multi-factor authentication experience. So if, if you connect to your network today, enter your code, and then for the next 30 days, for example, you're logging in from the same computer, from the same location, your home or your office, whichever it is, then you shouldn't be 
the, the computer shouldn't be bugging you every day for that for that response. It will only do so if it detects something unusual, for example, a new location or a different device. Um, there's a few other attributes it looks for. So it's a much smarter system and which helps uh, reduce the amount of uh, uh, disruption to the user. We had a follow-up question here on this topic. Um, they're stating they have MFA on all of the individual emails, but they're unsure of how to use um, the MFA when uh, multiple people need access to a shared email account. Yes, so that's a tricky one. So number one, if uh, if you're share, share, so shared IDs, you want to you want to reduce that as much as possible because it comes with its own uh, set of challenges. But if you absolutely must use a shared mailbox, um, another thing you can do is um, there's different ways you can configure it. So you can maybe even configure that what only one person actually logs in, and then you provide access to that mailbox to other users. Um, but Another way to do it is there's third-party tools. And I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a third-party tool you can implement where everyone can share kind of that, uh, the authenticator, for example. So it won't just go to one person's uh, phone. It, it'll go to like three different phones. Uh, but you definitely do want to still secure that, uh, um, that account uh, with MFA. So your two options there is configure it on the, on the email side or get a, a third party tool uh, to help you share that authentication between the three people. Is that third party tool called um, one password? It's one of them. Yeah. It, it, I think it, there's a few others. I think several of the major password uh, vaults providers have have that that tool as well. So uh, it's just a question of finding the one that works for you. But what you're looking for, just the the, the keyword you're looking for is OTP, which is what the, the terminology the, the tools use, which means other than password, which is what they call the the tool that generates the codes. Thank you. Um, and we have one more question before we leave this section. Um, it's a little bit specific. Um, but are, are you aware of any grant opportunities available that apply specifically to cybersecurity or the implementation of cybersecurity tools? I'm not aware of any off the top of my head, but uh, I know there are specific organizations dedicated to um, helping nonprofits advance their cybersecurity strategies. Um, I, I, again, I don't know them off the top of my head, but perhaps we can send it send it with the when you send out the the presentation but also if you google you know uh, nonprofit cybersecurity uh, um, you should find there's one or two organizations that I found in the past that they offer support now in terms of grants I'm not I'm not sure I think that may be something you you'll have to look for more at the local level uh, but I am aware that uh, Microsoft it's not really a grant but they do offer very special pricing so uh, uh, special pricing for nonprofits. I think that also expands to the to the licensing that you would need to get their uh, their security tool sets. Uh, so, for example, if you're already a Microsoft customer, maybe you have a lower level. So, maybe you didn't look at the more advanced license model because you were afraid of the cost. But I encourage you to look into it again, and there may you may be surprised in terms of uh, the, the pricing that's available there because. More of the more advanced security tools, you do have to go up to business premium, for example, uh, from a licensing perspective. Sure, sounds good. I also uh, shared some information about a grant resource in the Q and A for those that might be uh, more interested in that. Um, we are current on uh, questions, Felipe. Feel free to thank move you. Forward. So, uh, on that note, um, this is. It could be a very daunting challenge, I understand, for many small organizations. Uh, but uh, keep in mind, there are opportunities to partner with 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 uh, with expertise and get that get that expert level of support. And uh, it's uh, managed service providers can really help uh, organizations uh, get their arms around what the risks are, as I mentioned before, uh, put together custom tailored solutions uh, to uh, your nonprofit in terms of uh, your specific needs. And uh, some of the basic 
some of the basic opportunities to advance uh, your, your security program are very, very simple things like, for example, centralized device management. When you go with an MSP, a managed service provider, they take over your, the devices of your, uh, your, of your organization, manage them, automatically patch them, keep them up to date, uh, which is something that may be cost prohibitive for, for a small nonprofit to manage on their own. Um, as I mentioned before, the cybersecurity solutions, they can offer tool sets, uh, uh, comprehensive security solutions for your endpoint, your email, um, your internet uh, category filtering, <clears throat> uh, which would offer significant savings versus going out and buying all those products and managing them on your own. Uh, vulnerability assessments, again, uh, MSPs will have access to tools that can automatically scan and provide reports on the security state of your websites and your firewalls and your internal assets as well. And as we talked about before, policy development can be a huge nightmare. Uh, so they can definitely give you that support. Make sure your organization is aligned with the security framework that makes most sense and then help you develop those policies that you can grow into. Um, as your capabilities and your organizations expand. Uh, any questions on uh, so far? We did have one question. Uh, questions coming in. Is there any difference between nonprofit cybersecurity considerations and personal cybersecurity considerations? I, uh, I imagine there are some distinctions there. Could you maybe expand on that question a little bit? I'm not quite following. Um, I don't, uh, I think maybe they, they're asking, you know, what, what uh, you know, if I add a little context to some specifics of maybe a top two or three of what nonprofits should be on the lookout for when it comes to terms of uh, cybersecurity, what are the, what are the biggest um Right. Biggest uh, areas that uh, cybersecurity attacks come from. Yes. And, okay. So uh, no, I see. So it's very, it's very closely aligned actually, because many of the attacks that we've talked about so far are very similar to the ones that we'll see on an, on a personal individual level. And uh, so right off the bat, the email system is the most critical system to, to secure and, and, uh, and protect along with the identity and access side. So those two email security. So when I say email security, I mean, protecting your email system from, from malware, uh, from spam, uh, and also to make sure you track, um, protect the information that's within the email system uh, from uh, misuse. One of the things that we see more often when email systems get compromised is from there they gain access to other contacts within your email system and they start emailing uh, to, to, to your contact list and it just spreads like wildfire. So email system security, and uh, multi-factor authentication are, are the top two, uh, which both personal and for nonprofits. Um, you may have, um, some of you may not have been in the meeting before, but your email on the personal level, your, your email account is one of the most critical and most uh, sensitive pieces of information because if you lose control of your email, then the attacker can then change the passwords to everything else that you have that they find within your email, and then that would be an absolute nightmare to unravel. So, uh, Definitely, if you don't already, you should have multi-factor authentication on all of your email addresses. Uh, make sure you have complex passwords. If you can, if, if your email system supports it, use uh, passphrases, which are even better than passwords and harder to crack. And, uh, but definitely that, that multi-factor authentication is super important. And again, use the authenticator app versus texting or an email to get that code. It's, it's the most secure way and, uh, and it doesn't cost anything. So definitely 100% use that, use that tool. So, and on the nonprofit level, I'm gonna add a third one here because one of the, one of the other most common attacks we see is the social engineering attack where someone's, an organization is tricked into changing payment information for a vendor or an employee. So actually one of the most, one of the strongest controls against that attack is not even, it's, it's, it's a business process. Uh, control. So what I what I mean by that is, have a control within your accounts payable or accounting, whatever you call that department, um, to where none of that information is changed uh, unless you speak to a trusted contact. 
um, and they confirm that they actually want to change. In other words, don't just go off of an email. So uh, training your, your accounting and your, your, your AP staff on, on that control and, and embedding it into your policy and procedures uh, will go a long way to helping prevent uh, uh, victims, uh, your organization being victim to one of those attacks and, and, and having money stolen. Uh, because even if you have the proper security around your email system, as we all know, uh, security measures can be circumvented. So uh, one of the things we always say in security is that it's a layered approach, right? So uh, definitely also keep in mind that those, those business process controls are also very important to round out your security program at your organization. Anything else? That's it for questions at the moment. Okay, I believe that's all I have. Uh, so, um, yeah, if there's any other questions about anything we discussed, uh, is there anything in the chat? I'm not seeing any uh, any questions coming into the chat. Feel free to plug those in. Um, a recording uh, of the and this presentation will be sent in the next uh, next two days, maybe tomorrow, if we can get it uh, get the recording done in time. And we are happy to get yes. that to you as soon as we can. Uh, we did have I one saw, question pop in I here. Just saw it. Yeah. yeah, go ahead yes, and sir. respond. Yes. Yeah, the authenticator, you can mix and match. So I, I use it, my Google Authenticator for a lot of different applications. And um, and I, I use both and you can it, you can use, yes, you can use both, whichever one you think is uh, uh, you like better. But yes, you can definitely do that. Sorry, the question was, can you use the Microsoft Authenticator with Google email and vice versa? And the answer is yes. Uh, we had one question come in the chat. Can you offer an opinion about the security of Google Drive? So Google Drive um, has basic security. When I say that, is it it's 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 designed to be easy to use and easy to share information, but you have to be very cognizant in terms of sharing what type of sharing you're doing. You have the option to let people view what they're looking at and edit it, um, but that's about it. Versus uh, on the Microsoft side, you have uh, more complex sharing options where you can configure it to where you can share a, a document that no one can copy any data out of it. So there's a more there's a deeper level of controls you can add with on, on the Microsoft side. But so with Google, it's the security is 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 it works 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 well, but it's just limited in terms of uh, uh, options. So as long as you're cognizant in terms of when you're sharing um, uh, and also at the administrative level, if you wanna allow your users to share, uh, it's also something that should be considered as well. Maybe you only want one person deciding that for the organization versus everybody. But um, again, it all comes down to your data management strategy for your organization, uh, which is knowing what data you have, how it should be secured and making sure your users are well-trained as well. Uh, Leanne is asking, um, in your experience, do cybersecurity insurance companies provide any value to nonprofits through evaluation or training and awareness? I'm not sure on the training and awareness side, but I do know that they do offer um, organizations, they or as part of their onboarding, they perform assessments for them. Um, they do provide some are a little superficial in terms of they're looking at your website, anything publicly available, they don't do anything in depth. Um, so I would, while most of those tools are more for, for managing the risk profile and it's more benefits to security, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, insurance company more than you, I would definitely not rely on that alone. Let's put it that way. I would, I would, I would treat that as a, a, a nice extra, but, definitely wouldn't treat that as, I wouldn't rely on those as a sole secure way of, of checking my uh, security posture or training my users. Sure. Um, FC Development is asking, how should we implement 
uh, SSO for SaaS accounts for our staff? Can every app use SSO? If you if they are um, SaaS applications, and if they're supported. So, for example, if you're using Microsoft, Microsoft has an SSO capability, uh, but then you'd have to check with the the application itself. If it's a large, well-known application, like many folks use Razor's Edge, for example, uh, uh, if you go to the vendor website and search, it'll tell you, yes, we support these uh, single sign-on uh, um, solutions. And um, and then from there, if, if, you, if you see that it's supported, then you can definitely, there should be a connector there. So there should be no problem set up. And I believe uh, if, if, as long as you're using one of the top vendors, Microsoft, Okta, for example, uh, you shouldn't have any issue. It's when you get with the smaller providers that you may run into that problem that they don't support it. Sure. And uh, Judy is asking, what is the Microsoft management platform called? Uh, what do you mean by management platform? Uh, Judy, if you're, if you're still here, if you could help us... Uh... Elaborate on that question in the chat. We will pick it up. If Judy means like, uh, I think, I, well, if she's asking about like a administrative console or something like that, there's many. <laughs> there's uh, there's several different ones. So depending on the level of licensing you have, I think the most basic one is the admin, admin.microsoft.com, where you can, at the very basic level, administer identity and access for your users um, and your very basic uh, email exchange options. Uh, if you go one step higher, then they have the security uh, 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 console, which is security.microsoft.com. And then there's one after the other. If you have the mobility um, mobile device management system uh, named Intune, for example, then there'll be a different console for that. But uh, And then if you, if you get the Azure Cloud on top of that, um, if you have SharePoint, for example, and then you'll get into each each component as you add it through licensing will have its own. So there isn't one for everything. There are individual ones, depending on which, uh, which Microsoft capabilities you're taking your, your license for. Under, understood. Um, we have one more question. Mario's asking um, in the example of his organization, having multiple platforms, um, Office 365, Monday.com, QuickBooks, Adobe, et cetera. Um, I want, he's saying, I wonder if we can or should try to reduce the number of platforms uh, to offer easier training and uh, management r related to cybersecurity to our organization. And is that considered a recommendation um, from your perspective, Philippe? Yeah, well, the basic uh, recommendation for, for any organization is you, and if think about everything your organization does and everything they have, we call that an attack surface. So similar, like if you have a house, the larger your house, the more ways to get in there's going to be, and there's and the, the more difficult it is to secure. So um, if, if you can minimize, if you have, for example, two products doing essentially the same thing, you can minimize that, that'd be great. But if you have a business need for all those platforms, and that's fine, it's just a question of knowing what those are. So having a good inventory of all the applications your organization uses, what type of data they are, uh, are processing or storing or sharing, and then level of criticality. So as long as you have a good inventory of what you're using, how and why, and then you're uh, securing everything, each one of those platforms probably supports multi-factor authentication. So make sure that's turned on. And uh, if there's a way you can consolidate that using SSO, that makes the management a lot easier, especially if you use like a combination of SSO and MFA. So that would be something to look at if you find that, yes, we have 10 or 15 applications, but we need them all then SSO and MFA uh, together for all of them is, is one way you can easily manage them all uh, rather than individually, because it would be very cumbersome for your staff to have to log in to four or five different applications and do that MFA challenge four or five times a day. So, sure. Thank you very much, Felipe. And uh, for the attendees, I know there are um, can be very specific cases related to cybersecurity. I shared a number of links in the chat today to get more information on these uh, topics via TechSoup and Tech Impact. Uh, so feel free to review those. Um, maybe we can include those in the send um, tomorrow, Aretha. And uh, with that, I think we will close that out. Aretha, feel free to uh, close us out. And uh, thank you, Felipe, for the presentation. And thank you, attendees, for being here this afternoon.
Yeah, this was so, so good, Felipe. I learned a lot and you can tell how people were engaged in the conversation that they were really, you know, having those wheels turning. So thank you so much for being here and your great presentation. Yeah, thank you both as well. All right, have a great day, everybody.